let's talk about God's determinations. Um, by way of review, God's determinations is actually a collection of more than 30 different poems. Uh, and the preface is just the first poem that we have in our book here. So it has how many lines? 40, 1, 2, 3, 44 lines. And it's in two sections, which we're going to talk about. Um, the f first lines, 1 through 10, and the rest of the poem are in iambic pentameter. So the rhyme scheme of lines 1 through 10 is A, B, I'm sorry, A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, E, E. So looking at it real fast, beheld, gild, wherein, trim, vast, cast, command, stands, fine, smagardine, smaragdine, smaragdine. And it locks a silver box, spun, sun, set, get. So those, they rhyme in pairs, A, A, B, B, C, C. Uh, so if we compare the verse form of this poem with the previous meditations, uh, Taylor used a consistent stanza form for his meditations. So the stanza form looking at meditation six was a stanza of, um, I don't remember what the meter was, but the meter is the same in all of those stanzas, and they continued the same for all of his meditations. However, it's different than, than uh, God's determinations. God's determinations uh, is in what we call her the heroic couplet. Um, he uses the same stanza structure with heroic couplets in both poems as this one. So for all of his preparatory meditations, he used the sestet structure. So if we go back to the meditations, a sestet is a stanza of six lines. Am I thy gold, whether in mine, I'm counted so, less gold washed face, I fear my touchstone, and me and my counted gold. So six lines in each stanza. However, in God's meditations, like we said, they rhyme in, in pairs, and each two line pair is a heroic couplet and that's the basic thought um, structure so if you look at each at the God's determinations and each lines as in lines of pairs then you'll notice it's a complete thought every two lines so infinity when all things it beheld in nothing and of nothing all did build and then a new thought, upon what base was fixed the lathe, wherein he turned this globe, a wriggled it's so trim. So a new thought. And then the next one, who blew the bellows of his furnace fast, or held the mold wherein the world was cast? And then the new question, who laid its cornerstone, or whose command, where stand the pillars upon which it stands? So each two-line heroic couplet group is its own thought. Uh, now... Notice what kind of sentence is very is repeated in lines 1 through 19. They're almost all questions. The, the first one is not, right? Infinity when all things it beheld, in nothing and of nothing all did build. That's a, uh, well actually it is a statement, but it's a part of a question which ends in line 4. So uh, everything all the way through line 19 halfway through line 19 is a question and then beyond that what would naturally come after a question the rest of the poem is what what do you think an answer, an answer exactly so the rest of the poem is an answer to the questions asked in the first part of the poem now just looking at it yourself what do you think these questions are about Okay, it is about a person. What else? Yeah, go ahead and read it. About creation. Yes, it is about creation. And so, like you said, a person, it's about creation is God. 
Yeah. Um, but it's not, not just creation in general, but specifically the acts of creation, the things God did to create, right? So not just what he created, but the actions God did in creating. Um, he set the boundaries. He set a foundation for the world. He carved out the world. Um, he holds all things together. These are the kinds of things that it's talking about. So the actions of God. And what does what do these actions show us about God? Yeah, exactly. God has power. Um, when we look at the second half, we'll see that he, not only God has power, but the author, Edward Taylor, compares God and his power to our lack of power, our inability to do all these things. Um, can you compare, can you recognize any portion of scripture for me? For, yes, good. So, Job is so much like this. What about this is like Job, the passage of Job? And what passage are you thinking of? Um, I don't know if this passage, but this is um, God's, God's answer to Job's cry. Yes, that's like, chapters or, 39 to 41. Like, where were you when the poem was going to be like, Yes, exactly. Um, it's exactly like that. And what's interesting is that Edward Taylor is writing the same subject matter, right? It's the same stuff, what God did in creation. Uh, but from the perspective of man saying, look at you, God, uh, who has done all these things. Whereas in Job, it's God telling Job, uh, who did all these things? Let me question you. I'm interrogating you, right? It's a very different tone. <laughs> um, and yet, both of them are revealing not only God's power, but even more so in Job, God's power in light of God, Job or man's inability to do these things, right? Or his inability, his uninfinity, his fin finitude, um, in that Job was not there at the beginning, right? So that's, that's referencing Job's finitude, his inability to be there. Um, it's very fascinating, the kind of, especially I think it's fascinating, the difference in tone between these and this and Job's passage. Um, good. All right, so let's look at the second half. Can you find, there's that question on the side there. It says paradox. What example of paradox can you find in line 17 to 24? Do you find an example of paradox? And again, a paradox is not simply a contradiction, but it is what looks like a contradiction without actually being a contradiction. So upon finding out more information of something uh, or looked at in a certain way, the contradiction is not a contradiction. It makes sense in some, in some manner. So that's a paradox. What? Yeah, perfect. That's a great example. His glorious handiwork not made by hands, who spoke all things from nothing, and with ease can speak all things to nothing if he please. Good. I really like the next line too, those next two lines. Who spoke all things from nothing, which is a paradox from the first, the first two lines of the poem. Infinity when all things that beheld, in nothing and of nothing all did build. How did God build the universe from nothing, right? And that's a contradiction to say something came from nothing. Which is why evolution can't say that it came from nothing. It has to say that evolution came from this tiny little spot of matter that was infinitely small, right? Because um, evolution can't logically say that it came from nothing. Well, then where did that spot come from, right? So that's the problem, the logical problem with, with um, evolution because it is a contradiction. And this looks like a contradiction. The, the answer then is God's omnipotence, right? His ability to do the impossible, to overcome the contradiction, which makes it a paradox. 
and that's what it references is here. Uh, who spoke all things from nothing? However, I like this paradox. Who spoke all things from nothing and with ease can speak all things to nothing, if he please. Uh, God, being sovereign and being God himself, has the right, not only the ability to call all things into existence, but he also, being sovereign, has the right to call all things to nothing, right? Because it's his creation. He can do with it what he wants. I can do with whatever I can do with this, like, phone, right? Whatever I want because it's mine. I own it. I didn't make it. But let's say I make a piece of pottery, and that's the argument that Paul makes in Romans 9. He says that what right do I have to call God out? for making decisions uh, based on his sovereignty. Uh, I don't have that right. What right does the, the potter have over his clay? He can do with it what he will, right? Um, and yet, where is the paradox? We're still here. He has not called into exist to nothing all things, even though he has the power and the right. Uh, and he would be just in doing so because the entire world is in rebellion against him. Uh, it would be just judgment for him to do so, and yet he doesn't. That's a paradox. Uh, the fact that he has a right to call all things to nothing, and yet he is so merciful and patient in putting up with our sin for so long, uh, that is a paradox that just should really humble us. So, Good. <clears throat> paradox all throughout this poem uh, and when we when we look at poetry this is the last thing when we look at poetry we want to like C.S. Lewis said really try to understand where the author is coming from what is his purpose in writing what he has written um, so as far as the paradox goes why do you think the author Edward Taylor would include so many paradoxes like what would be his purpose in doing so what is he trying to accomplish by adding these paradoxes? In? Okay, like what? Well, I guess it's a lot. It's a lot. I guess it's um. It's throughout this. Maybe it's throughout the history that the problem is the problem that people have with Christianity is that is that they don't they don't think in their minds like they don't think that it's um reliable like how could they. Yeah, but you're right. Pure logic and science won't get you to heaven. Yeah. Or a saving knowledge of Christ. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, I think you spoke earlier. Maybe that's his point that pure logic and science like, cannot explain like, like, the beauty and wonder of God. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a great point. That's, um,. Not what it says in the book, but it's a but it's a good answer. No, I mean in my teacher book, um, to that question. But I think it's an extremely legitimate answer. Yeah. Good. Maybe even better than their answer. I'm not going to say what their answer was because I liked yours more. So. <laughs> um, good. So we have we have these paradoxes. We have them for a reason. Um, we have this theme of God's omnipotence. In light of in in the context of our inability, right? And having reference Job or alluding to Job's conversation, it even more so stresses that we're in, unable to comprehend fully comprehend God. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't know God, right? Because some people try to make that excuse. They'll say, "Well, God is beyond our comprehension, so we can't know Him." Right? That's I think something like the deist approach, where God 
is unknowable. He started the, the universe in motion so we can understand the universe because it's based on rules set up by a God, but we can't know God. He's beyond us, right? But just because we can't fully understand God doesn't mean we can't know God. I mean, I don't fully understand my wife, but <laughs> that doesn't mean I don't know her, right? Uh, and I have my whole life to get to know her better and better. And it's the same with God. Just because we don't fully understand God or everything he does doesn't mean we can't know God. Uh, and he has made himself known most of all in Jesus Christ, uh, but also through his creation. There's a lot we can learn about God through his creation. That is God's determination.